Welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie, a slice of faith for our messy lives. I'm Tony Kolank, a professor at Ave Maria School of Law, the father of five grown children, and also the author of inspirational fiction for teens and adults. I want to mention, by the way, that as the fifth book in my medieval teen series, The Hardwood Mysteries, gets released, I am available to come speak with any of your schools or homeschool groups about a host of topics, whether it's writing or the Middle Ages or the Crusades. Uh, you can just check out my website for any details. But today we're going to be speaking with Jamie Ogle about how faith can give us the courage to take on seemingly impossible tasks in our lives. <music> My guest today is Jamie Ogle. She's a homeschool mom by day, a reader by night, and a writer before dawn. She studied English and writing craft at Iowa State University. She's also a member of the American Christian Fiction Writers. She writes historical fiction that's infused with hope, adventure, and courageous rebels. Born in Minnesota, she now lives in Iowa with her husband and three children, where she can usually be found gardening, beekeeping, and tromping through the woods. Jamie, welcome to The Shepherd's Pie. Thank you so much for having me, Tony. Happy to be here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you got into writing, and, uh, and maybe even uh, specifically how you got into writing historical fiction. I grew up just kind of enthralled with story and really surrounded by it. Um, my grandparents were great storytellers. They fought in World War II and crossed Nebraska in a covered wagon and panned for gold in Alaska. And they just had all these just amazing stories and they loved to share them. And so every time they'd come down for dinner, I just loved sitting at the table and hearing all the stories and just hearing them talk about their lives and experiencing these, you know, the Great Depression and things like that. And living through that, it made history come alive to me in a totally different way. And so I was homeschooled. So when I was studying history and stuff, my mind would just be running with, oh man, I wonder what that smelled like or felt like, or, you know, what that would have looked like. Their stories just brought history to life for me. And so I just fell in love with history and historical fiction just kind of came from that. And then I was just a weird kid. You know, <laughs> I was always in a land of make-believe, making up my own stories and playing out in the woods and trying to be the hero. Who wasn't that you just described my childhood too? playing out, <laughs> playing out in the backyard with sticks, shooting at trees and yeah, pretending I was sure. in, climbing trees like uh, Legolas in the Lord of the Rings or something. Your latest book here, uh, as we're heading towards Halloween and All Saints Day, uh, it's actually a book that deals with a very popular saint that we probably have all heard of, St. Valentine. And of course, your book is called Of Love and Treason. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, why you decided to choose Valentine of everyone in the world to write about? Well, that sort of came from me not liking Valentine's Day and thinking it was just dumb and super commercialized. And I don't need a holiday to tell me to buy something for somebody. That's just silly. And, you know, I was just trying to justify myself and these these thoughts I had. And so I was like, fine, I'm just going to look up and see what it's really about. And then I can just tell everybody how dumb it is, right? So I started digging into Valentine's Day and, you know, his stories and all the different stories about him that are sometimes conflicting, but, you know, still have threads of the same story running through them, just kind of got captured up by that story and was like, okay, well, how does this fit into the Roman Empire? Why is this story such a big deal that we're remembering it so many years later? And the deeper I got into it, I was just yeah, I just, I had to start writing it down. And I started by look, looking for the novel, like somebody has made a novel out of this or a movie or something like this is amazing. And um, I could not find one. And so just the scenes and conversations and little bits and pieces just started popping into my head and started writing them down. And then it became the really long first draft of this novel. <laughs> So Valentine is, is in Rome around 270 AD, mm -hmm. and you said you, you went looking for information about him. What do we know about him as far as, like, where do we go to find that information? Is there anything from his time period that tells us about him? Yeah, so there's nothing from his time period. He didn't leave any writings. No contemporaries mention him. Um, and he's really not mentioned in history until... It's in the late 400s when Pope Galatius started Valentine's Day. And so that's kind of the first real mention in history that we have of him and his stories. And so if you kind of look around, there's not really anything 
hard and fast written about him. Even then, it was just he was a priest or a pastor or elite church leader who married people against the emperor's marriage ban and fell in love with a jailer's daughter who was blind. And there's a miraculous healing there. And so then there's all these conflicting stories of, well, how did that go down? And um, so that was really fun to kind of piece together and pull apart and like, okay, how do these legends, these bits and pieces of story match up with, you know, the history of the Roman Empire, the culture of Rome at the time? How could these pieces of story be true and kind of working them in together? So did you ever figure out why Rome would want to ban marriage and what kind of marriages were they banning? The lower soldiers in the Roman army were banned from being like officially married. Um, It just kind of kept their mind on the war and what they were supposed to be doing versus having all these, you know, home obligations or wives or children they're thinking about and maybe making them less brave because they don't want to die. So the lower, you know, the foot soldiers were kind of already banned from marriage. So that was kind of the thing I was running into was like, well, this is already, this is already passed. Like, why do we have this story that that Emperor Claudius II banned marriage? And there's really no written record that he even did that. And so we just have that legend to go on. So then I started looking at like, okay, well, what's going on in the world around this time? Emperors would make up stuff all the time. And then if people didn't like it, they would just kind of erase it, chisel it off the monuments. So that was sort of like me digging into like, okay, we're in the middle of a war. They're not doing super great right now. So what if he passed a temporary ban for everybody? So that way nobody could get out of military service by being married. So that was sort of where I went with this. And then, you know, Valentine not being okay with that. At this time in history, 270 is still prior to Christianity being legalized or accepted Mm -hmm. in the Roman Empire. So maybe set the stage a little bit for kind of what it was like to be a Christian at this time. So at this time, there's no, you know, we're past Nero and that really bad stuff that he was doing. Um, And so ever since then, there was sort of an ebb and flow in persecution of the church. Romans valued tradition and things that have lasted a long time. So they were okay with the Jews because their religion was very ancient. And while they sacked Jerusalem and did terrible things then, eventually they were just kind of like, let the Jews be exempt from burning incense to the emperor or anything like that, declaring their allegiance to the empire in that way. But the Christians were very new, and they kind of separated themselves from the Jewish community, like we are not Jews, and the Jews were like, yeah, they're definitely not us. And so they kind of became this new religion that was not traditional, didn't have these ancient roots. And so they were a suspect for that reason. And also just the way that they had these practices that only Christians could partake in communion or things like that. And so they were sort of secretive in that way. They had just the the equality within them. There was, you know, no distinction between the very upper class people and the slaves. They were all calling each other brother and sister. And that really upset this very um, social stratus of the Roman Empire at the time. So they had a lot of things kind of working against them um, at this time, just for those reasons. And then just sort of the, just the ebb and flow of things happening in the empire It's said that Romans at this point in history were not like super devoted to the gods, but like they were because it was traditional and not because they really believed they had power, but you know, you do the things out of tradition. But when things started going sour with wars or famine or whatever it was, they looked around for like, okay, well, what's, what's going on here? What's to blame? Who's to blame? It's gotta be the Christians, right? Because they're not burning incense to the gods. Like clearly we're all suffering because of them. And so persecution would ramp up for a while and then it would go away and then it would, you know, something else would happen. And so there was sort of these periods of intense persecution and then not so much. And it also changed wherever they were in the empire. You know, sometimes it would be this city and not this other city. It was a little bit sporadic at this point. How is it that you weaved all of this history and, and these legends into a novel that would carry a modern reader along? I started with Valentine and all these stories and pieced together now who could he have been based on the legends and how could he have fit into the Roman Roman society? How could he have legally married people? Um, Because you had to be able to write legal documents. And so that's why I made him a notarius. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about doing all that and writing this and researching the, the Roman Empire and all that was really realizing that people haven't changed over time all that much. 
you know, our hopes and dreams, our desires, our longings for love and security and safety and, you know, prosperity, like those things have not really changed over time. You know, it's kind of digging into these people and seeing that was, it was really, um, I don't know, you kind of feel a connection with them just because you realize, oh, they aren't so different. It feels like they're so ancient and so separate from who we are today. Like we are obviously way more educated, you know, whatever. We always think these things and then you kind of dig into who they are and realize, oh, we're not, we're not all that different. And so I felt like, yeah, the the issues they're facing then, the issues of, you know, just courage and standing up for what you believe in and, you know, and it's not popular, that is something we're dealing with all the time, even now. Yeah, actually, in some ways, this uh, this topic, since he's really defending marriage, is what mm-hmm. is really what you've got. Somebody who's defending the dignity of marriage at a time when the state is attacking it. Uh, it's quite current, actually, right? I mean, that's the, the mm-hmm. marriage wars, as we might want to call them, that have been going on, and you know, in the world the last several years, have led to a lot of Christians, I think, having to take a stand that has gotten them into some trouble. So, so we're going to definitely want to talk about that because that's, you know, one of the reasons uh, that we're here is to kind of talk about how our faith helps us to face those hard times. And in fact, I, I was noting in your author's note, you mentioned times will come in our lives when we need to take a stand and risk something in the process. The questions Valentine faced are the same ones we face today. Will we choose to follow God? Is God worth the risk? I guess putting yourself into Valentine's shoes, you know, how did you see faith working with him? I'm assuming he, uh, things don't turn out very well for him in the end. Um, Yeah. I mean, I guess if anybody looks up the legends or knows the legends, Christians in Rome, it's a pretty, (laughs) you sort of know the ending just from there, but it's the whole idea of, do we trust God when he answers prayers the way we want him to? Is that the only time we can trust him when we can you know, when he gives us that yes that we want, or can we trust him when the answer is no? And I was sort of wrestling with that in my own life as I was writing this book. I had most of it written, and I was getting to the end, and then things started happening. And, you know, I was praying for one thing, and and yet, and God said yes, and it was amazing. And then, and then he said no, and it was like, it was crushing. It was really crushing. And so I was, you know, sort of wrestling with the same things like, okay, I could trust you a little bit ago when you said yes. And like, I was super excited about that. And now you're saying no. And now I have to decide, are you still good? Can I still trust you? Can I move forward knowing that you're good and you're going to work this all out for the good in the end, even if I can't see it, if I don't know what it is. And so I was sort of wrestling with that at the same time as writing this book and realizing, oh my goodness, we're in the same struggle at this, you know, very different, you know, circumstances, but still that same issue of God's sovereignty and and trusting him through the hard times as well as the good times. Yeah, and probably the stuff you and I are going through right now doesn't compare to what Valentine had to face. I'm assuming the of love and treason, the treason part is the fact that he is treasonously marrying people against what the state requires. So how do you have him trust in God when things are not looking like they're going to turn out very well, at least in this world for him? Yeah, I mean, he has to make this decision where he's sort of, he's got a lot to lose at this point. You know, he's a young man, he's got his whole life ahead of him. And he could, he could just say no, and he could, you know, walk away from this commitment he's made to to doing these weddings and he could he could save his life and and yet he realizes that this commitment he's made to this path that he's chosen to this calling he feels that God has led him to that he needs to be obedient to that and fulfill it even though it might mean giving up something in the process losing what he's you know sort of longed for this whole time uh, i noticed you talked about do we trust god even when things don't look like they're going to turn out the way we want them to turn out um, that reminds me of in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into the fiery furnace and yes. them saying to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, well, even if God doesn't save us, we're still going to praise him or whatever they say. Was that part of your inspiration uh, in this? Oh, for sure. I love that story. And yes, what they say is even if even if he does not, he is still worthy of our worship. We are still not going to bow down to your statue. That sort of you know, it's kind of reckless courage almost and reckless faith, but so, so powerful. 
and God does come through for them. And that's, that's powerful too. But in that beginning, in that moment, when they're in the having to make that decision, not knowing how it's going to turn out, if there's going to be a miracle or not, they were, they were willing to, to risk it all for him and for who he is. I know as an author, when I'm writing my stories and I'm trying to struggle with some of these same concepts, I always try to make it relevant to my life. I think about in my own life where I failed or where I've seen other people succeed or fail. Were you inspired by Valentine as you were sort of putting this story together to follow his examples at all? I mean, did it have any impact on your own life? For sure. I mean, I wrote this well, I'd written first drafts and I was really, really revising it and honing the story into what it is during COVID. And when all the the craziness, you know, every, oh my goodness, the world is ending, hide, <laughs> like that's all going on. And, and I have, you know, little kids at home and I felt, you know, we were homeschooling and I felt God very clearly saying that you need to put your kids in public school right now. I'm like what? No. Why? That's a terrible idea. Everybody's pulling their kids out of public school. I'm not doing that. Like, no, that's that's crazy. And we just both my husband and I both felt really strongly. God is like really pushing us to do this. And I didn't want to. I could protect them at home, right? (laughs) They were under my protection. You know, I can't just let them go. You know, that was God really worked in me to let go of that fear. It was him working through this whole situation and saying, like, I've got your kids. It's okay. I can protect them. Just you just need to trust me with them. Like they're the most precious things to you, but you need to trust me with them. And so that was, you know, as these characters are going through, you know, how trusting God and, you know, sort of in a situation where it's out of their control, you know, that all these forces on the outside are sort of doing all these other things. And so, yeah, that was a time when I had to kind of put my faith into action and trust God with my most precious things, you know, letting my kids go to school and trusting that he's going to protect them when they're out of my sight. Now, this is an amazing story. Actually, I want, <laughs> did you get a sense as to why God might have been tugging you to do that? Because that does sound like the opposite of what like we would think God would want us to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it was really, he was really working on my heart and my fear And my coping with fear by just protecting everybody, like, I've got this, I'm going to control this situation, I can control this situation, it's under my control, I've got this. And I wasn't trusting God to control or like, I wasn't relinquishing any of that control to him. Who am I to think that I have any control over anything? (laughs) You know, and it was like, really, God just working on that, on that part of me, the pride that I had to think that I could do anything. And he did. He watched over the kids, protected them. They had a great two years, partially in school, partially at home, because it was a little bit of online learning. But but it was really, I felt my faith deepen and grow and just my trust in him and God just sanding off those edges of control and pride that I carried. Yeah, this is a remarkable story. And then after COVID was over, then you brought them back home to homeschool again? Yeah, yep. (laughs) So in the meantime, as you're going through this, you're also juggling with St. Valentine coming to terms with, hey, I'm going against the state. This isn't good for me. And this could end very badly, but I still have to trust God. So yeah, what was that like? Is there anything, other insights that you sort of gained from your main character as you were writing it? So the story is kind of, it's told from, from Valentine's perspective, and it's also told from the point of view of the jailer's daughter who is blind and having all these problems at home and thinking like, oh, if I can just see, if I could just have my sight back, like all of these things would be better. Then I could kind of control my life a little bit. I could fix all these problems. And so I feel like I, I resonated with Valentine a little bit, but I more resonated with her and then how, you know, God worked in her life. And then she's sort of left kind of struggling, like, how can I trust a God who can do these amazing miracles? And yet look at all of his people. They are like in big trouble. I am in big trouble now because I'm following this God. Like I thought he was going to make my life easier. And he's, he's not like he's, he's putting my life, like my life is now in danger. And so just kind of wrestling with the eternal worth, like the, the worth of eternity versus this temporal life and just sort of really readjusting like your view of the world and your life, but also your view of God and how he is sovereign and holy and above everything else and worthy of any little 
discomfort we could have here. Like it's worth it. (laughs) And that was, that was sort of, you know, what she sort of wrestles with and comes to grip with like, okay, I can trust you. You are worth it. And I think we, we can all learn that lesson. (laughs) Yeah. I love this theme. It's something that I think we need to hear about today. I like to use some of that same themes in in my writing too, because I think young people need to hear about this today, right? They're so focused on like adults because we've taught them Mm -hmm. so well. They're all so focused on just the here and the now and the pleasing themselves for this moment. I mean, already they were teenagers or whatever, so that was already going to be it. But now you've got this totally countercultural message that mm-hmm. uh, that Valentine and the jailer's daughter and yourself, even with this COVID story, are basically uh, telling. So if if there are folks listening to this show right now who you know are struggling with some difficult things in their lives and they're like, gosh, I don't know if I should trust God with this because what if he doesn't come through? What if it doesn't come out the way I thought it should? Just based on your own you know, experiences and what you kind of went through when you were struggling through these characters, do you have any advice you might give to them? From my own experience and seeing that God cares. He does. He loves us so deeply. I mean, he sent his son for us and, you know, sacrificed his life for ours. He cares. And I think we sort of get into our own mindset of like, well, this is, this is my life. And this is the thing that needs to happen to make me happy right now. And we sort of lose track of the sight of the, the sight that we are part of a much larger story that spans all of history. We're part of God's story. We're telling his story. And our threads, our, our highs and our lows, they're all part of a picture that we can't see yet here. And we will someday. And it's going to be amazing. And, you know, just knowing that as I was going through my struggles and not knowing like, okay, why did you let this happen? Some of it is just, it's a little bit blind faith, but it's also it's so comforting because as soon as I made the decision, you know, just sobbing in my room, like, okay, God, I can trust you. I know you are good the peace of God, it just, it overwhelms you. And he he's there and he's ready to, to step in and, and comfort you and carry you through whatever you're dealing with. Even if he's allowing you to walk through these hard times, like he is going to be there to comfort you, even if he doesn't pull you out of it. Yeah. It's like that, that phrase, Jesus, I trust in you. Sometimes that's like the only prayer you can say, Mm -hmm. you don't know how, you don't know how it's going to work out. You just have to trust. And then however it works out, you realize with hindsight, as you were talking, I was thinking about actually something one of my characters says in one of my books when he's thinking about the Old Testament and the Israelites in Egypt, where they were enslaved for 400 years. And I was thinking how many generations of Israelites were slaves, not ever knowing what was going to happen to them, that they were going to be saved. And they went and lived their whole lives in slavery, never knowing that God was going to save them. Like, what would it have been like living in their shoes when, you know, or in Babylon, that was only 70 years. So, I mean, one generation or whatever, but, you know, when, like you said, when you take a step back and you look at it from the, you know, lens of God's eye as much as you can, right. Of all of history. I don't know. Now, is that something that gives us courage or strength to, uh, to trust God more? Or is it just blind faith at that point? (laughs) I, I think so. I think that's why we have these these stories in the Old Testament. We have all those stories in the Old Testament. We have the stories of Joseph and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're going through terrible things. You know, they're taken away from their homes, their families. In that moment, they felt like God had probably forsaken them. You know, I'm sure you can't help but feel those things. And then How are they supposed to know that however many years later, Daniel was going to be the advisor to the king? And you know what I mean? Like we we have these moments where it seems like all is lost, but it's not. We just can't see what's going to happen in in the years ahead. So I think that is really hopeful. It is. If we can do it, right? Nice work if you can get it. Um, (laughs) So that's the challenge to us all. Uh, So this sounds great. I'm sure the story itself is, I'm sure, very compelling. Tell us uh, how, if folks want to get a hold of your book or or even some of your other things that you're writing, where would you like them to go? Um, You can head to my website, jamieogle.com. That has all the links to Facebook, Instagram, BookBub, like all the the things where you can find me. Um, It also, there's um, a book page and there's links to everywhere you can buy it. You can pre-order it from any bookstore, your local bookstore, mostly active on Instagram though. 
Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your conversation today and, and the insights that you're bringing and even just your uh, your insights from your own life during COVID, which I'm sure we can all <laughs> relate to. <laughs> I really appreciate having you on the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Tony. This has been great. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the show today. Uh, again, we've been speaking with Jamie Ogle about courage to face the hard times in our lives, like St. Valentine did. Um, and again, this is Anthony Barone Kolank. If you want to learn more about me or uh, any of my writing, come to my website, anthonykolank.com. Until next time, may God bless us as we rely on our faith to work through the messy challenges of our lives.